What the heck? Togon. And it's quite easy to try and solve. What we're actually going to do is sort of put it back in this form here, where we have secant times secant squared, and we're going to use integration by parts. So we know that secant cubed is secant times secant squared. Now, we want to take the derivative of one of those and integrate the other. And it makes the most sense to take the derivative of the secant function and integrate secant squared. Because what is the integral of secant squared? It's tangent. So, or I'm sorry, the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent. So what we're going to do is take the derivative of secant of theta, which is quite easy. It's just secant theta times tangent theta. I hope that's an easy to remember fact from Calc 1. Um, I'm probably not going to ever do a video deriving that. It's quite um, elementary, so you may as well just try it on your own. And we're going to, and this is d theta, right? And we're going to integrate secant squared theta d theta to end up at tangent theta. And now we're going to do integration by parts. So multiply these two things together and subtract the integral of the product of those two things. And so all I'm going to do is actually find the antiderivative of secant cubed right now, and then we're going to plug it in because it's interesting to find the antiderivative of secant cubed. So we're just going to pretend that this 2 isn't there and these bounds aren't there, and we're just doing the integral of secant cubed. So based on the fact of the differentiation and integration I just did, we're going to end up with secant theta times tangent of theta minus the integral of tangent squared theta times secant theta, d theta, because that's what we got from the integration by parts. But c tangent squared is secant squared minus 1. So this is equal to secant of theta tan theta. This is equal to the integral of secant cubed theta d theta. Right? That's what we're solving for. And so we end up with secant times tangent minus the integral of secant squared minus 1 times secant of theta d theta. Distribute the secant in and break up the integral into two pieces, and we end up with secant of theta tangent of theta minus the integral of secant squared times secant, which is secant cubed, very nice, minus minus secant of theta d theta, so plus the integral of secant theta d theta. And look at that. We have that the integral of secant cubed is stuff minus the integral of secant cubed, which means we can add it over, and we actually end up with the representation. If we add that over, we get 2 times the integral of secant cubed, which means we can just divide through by 2, and we'll end up with the right answer. And what's the integral of secant? Well, it's a very, very interesting uh, thing to derive, and Papa Flammy just did a great, great video on deriving it in a different way that sort of writes it in a very, very funky way. But essentially, we're going to go with the standard result, which is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of secant of theta plus tangent of theta. So we're going to add the secant cubed over, which will give us 2 on this side of the equation, and we're going to divide by 2. So we end up with the fact that the integral, well, no, actually, we'll keep the 2. We'll keep the 2, because we need it for this, right? We'll keep the 2. So we're going to add the secant cubed over, and we're going to get that 2 times the integral of secant cubed theta, d theta, is equal to secant theta tangent theta plus the natural logarithm of the absolute value of secant theta plus tangent theta plus c, some constant, right? And this is fine. This is fine because we know what this integral is. It's a pretty standard result. And we added the secant cubed over, so we didn't subtract it. It's not like they canceled and we're not getting any information. We've got 2 times the integral from, of secant cubed, which is exactly what we want. So now, as long as we can just, by the way, this is a beautiful result, but as long as we can now just plug in 0 to pi over 4, we'll get our universal parabolic constant. We'll have the number. So all we have to do is take this integral from 0 to pi over 4, which is to say evaluate this from 0 to pi over 4, which means there won't be any constant, of course. And so this is just going to be secant of pi over 4 times tangent of pi over 4 plus ln of secant pi over 4 plus tangent of pi over 4. And we know that tangent of 0 is 0, secant of 0 is 1. So secant 0, tangent 0 is going to be 0. We know that secant of 0 is 1 and tangent of 0 is 0. So we're going to end up with a natural logarithm of 1, which is also 0. So we just need to evaluate this, and we will have our universal parabolic constant. Well, what is the secant of pi over 4? That's just 1 over the cosine of pi over 4. And the cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, or 1 divided by the square root of 2, which is to say that this is equal to the square root of 2. Tangent of pi over 4 is equal to 1, which means that this is equal to square root of 2 plus 1, which means the universal parabolic constant is equal to the natural logarithm of 1 plus square root of 2 plus the square root of 2. That 
is the universal parabolic constant, the ratio of the arc length that is subtended by the lattice rectum on a parabola divided by its focal parameter, and it is about 2.29. It is a transcendental number. You can easily prove that using the uh, lindemann weierstrass theorem, um, which is a very, very huge piece of mathematical machinery. But now that we've got this, we've seen that it's a relationship to do with the parabola, that we need to use trigonometric substitutions to solve for it, so circles are involved, and we just showed before earlier that it's that this form here has to do with the unit hyperbola. But also, one more reason why it has to do with the unit hyperbola is, I can erase all this now, it's a very interesting little thing. So, check this out. So we know that this is equal to the natural logarithm of 1 plus the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2. But in our video of solving for the natural logarithmic forms of the inverse trig and hyperbolic functions, we determined that the hyperbolic sine, the inverse hyperbolic sine of x was equal to the natural logarithm of x plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 1. And we derived that the inverse hyperbolic cosine is equal to the natural logarithm of x plus or minus the square root of x squared minus 1, right? Which means we can write the universal parabolic constant, which we needed to use circle trigonometry to solve for, in terms of inverse hyperbolic functions. Because look, we can plug 1 into the, hyper the inverse hyperbolic sine, and look what we get. We get that the universal parabolic constant is equal to the natural logarithm of 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 squared plus 1 plus square root of 2, which is exactly what the universal parabolic constant is. So that's to say that the universal parabolic constant is also equal to the inverse hyperbolic sine of 1 plus the square root of 2. In the same vein, we can plug the square root of 2 into the inverse hyperbolic cosine because the square root of 2 squared is 2, minus 1 is 1, the square root of 1 is 1, and then the square root of 2 there gives exactly the square root of 2 that we want. But we also still have this one on the outside. So what it's actually also equal to is the inverse hyperbolic cosine of the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2. So the inverse... So the, so the universal parabolic constant is a constant related to a parabola, which you need circle trigonometry to solve for, which you then can represent using hyperbolic functions. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. It's just lovely. And so one more time, let's write it out. So the universal parabolic constant is equal to the natural logarithm of 1 plus the square root of 2, all plus the square root of 2. And this is about 2.29. It is also six times the average distance from any point in a square to the center, as far as I remember that definition. So if you were to give yourself a, squ a square and put a point anywhere in it at random, the average distance from a random point in the square to the center of the square is p divided by 6. So this is a unit square, of course, and if you divide this number by 6, that is the average distance from any point in a square to the center, which is a brilliant fact that I will not prove. I hope this was as enjoyable for me as it was for those watching. This is a lovely number, it's a lovely fact, and I'm just really happy that I got to incorporate all three different kinds of those uh, conic sections into this problem. Um, so in the next video, we're going to go over the nice analogies that we see with hyperbolic functions and the unit hyperbola with regards to what we already know about regular trig functions and the unit circle. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, go f*** yourself. Quick little thing, this channel has an Instagram, so it is at what the hectagon, of course, and it has a Twitter. Also, so this is Instagram, and of course this is Twitter, and it is of course naturally of course, naturally, naturally, of course. Also, what the hectagon? At what the hectagon? Nope. At the hectagon. Oop, oh, can't spell today. Okay. Hectagon. And my email is the incorrectly spelled what the hectagon. Why spell check before you make the email, right? That you can't then change. At gmail.com. Now all of these are in the description if you don't want to have to somehow watch the video and pause it and actually write it down. Um, along with other Instagram, Twitter, YouTube accounts that me and my friend Bill run. Uh, he does one for DND. We together stream on Mixer under the moniker of Fred Wood Live. So check the description for other stuff. This is just for my channel. This is my Instagram at what the heck dogon, Twitter at what the heck dogon, and email at what the heck agon because I spelled it wrong when I made the email and now I can't change it. So, 
that's the uh, that's the stuff. Thank you for watching, and uh, bye bye.